It's good to have Mike Timms back, isn't it? Well, this is a great and appropriate time to talk about God's Word, so I want to invite you to open your Bibles to James chapter 1. We're in the message series called Wisdom That Works, and we've understood that this book of James has got such practical wisdom. In fact, before the service, I was talking to somebody about uh, how God's Word works and how practical it is, and he was talking about um, a, a devotional on leadership that uh, was communicated to people in his company, and it was all about God's Word and God's principles about leading and, and how encouraging that was to uh, those in his company, those who don't attend church, who may not be believers, and it just works. It works, however, when we put it to work. There's a condition. I had a very real moment when I was in seminary years ago, and I was studying for my Greek class, and and I was reading and studying, and, and I had this moment where, you know, the Lord just really impressed on my heart. He said, God, Mike, are you, are you reading? Are you just studying God's Word just so you can know it academically? You study it so you can teach it and preach it? And God, in a real sense, said to me, my word is not to fill your mind. My word is to transform your life. And so there's this gulf between knowledge and practice that often takes place in believers. And sometimes people say to me, boy, you know, the Lord really used you to speak to me. And I've learned over the years, being a pastor over these years, that the way that I can ensure that God's word speaks to you is that I let it speak to me first. And so any challenge or any conviction or anything that takes place with you guys, believe me, it's rolled around inside of me for a long time, and that's one of the curses of being a teacher. It speaks to you first, and that's good. God's Word is to be lived, not just to be known. In fact, we know much more than we put into practice. And that's James's point here. That's what he's talking about in this passage. We're going to look in verses 19 through 27. The Apostle James calls us to a place of no disparity between what we hear on Sunday morning and how we live throughout the week. A.W. Tozer, the great theologian and author of the early 20th century, wrote a book called The Root of Righteousness. Let me read some of what he says in his book, he says, there is an evil which in, a, in its effect upon the Christian religion may be more destructive than communism, Romanism, and liberalism combined. It is the glaring disparity between theology and practice among professing Christians. So wide is the gulf that separates theory from practice in the church that an inquiring stranger who chances upon both would scarcely dream that there was any relation between the two. Christians habitually weep and pray over beautiful truth, only to draw back from that same truth when it comes to the difficult job of putting it into practice. It appears that too many Christians want to enjoy the thrill of feeling right, but are not willing to endure the inconvenience of being right. That's what James is saying. So let's read, beginning in verse 19. Now remember the background a little bit. The book of James was written by the brother, half-brother of Jesus. And so his words are very important. Nobody knew Jesus better than his brother James. And he writes this letter to Jewish Christians who are facing suffering and who are dispersed all throughout the Roman world. And he's writing to encourage them. And he's, he's trying to tell them, listen, no matter where you are, no matter what you're facing in your life, no matter what challenges you have... Put God's word into practice. Live out your faith. Because therein lies the power of your faith in living it out. So he provides practical wisdom. And what we've tried to encourage you to do in this message series, and you'll find a message outline including in, included in your program, on the back of that is a little thing called a James Journal. We want you to write something down each and every week of how God has spoken to you and one thing that you will begin doing as a result of what you learn. And at the end of the message series, we're going to arrange our website in such a way that some of you can uh, post and 
uh, anonymously post on that website some of the things that God has taught you throughout the book of James as we walk verse by verse through the entire book. So I want to encourage you to participate in that. In verses 19 through 27, James gives three imperatives, three verbs, and laced around those verbs is practical wisdom that helps us to not only hear God's word, but to receive it and to apply it into our lives. Those three verbs are this, listen, hear, or listen, accept, or receive, and do. Real simple. So, let's read it. Verse 19, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become anger, angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Three imperatives. The first one is this. Hear the word. Hear the word. That's found in verse 19. Hear the word. Okay? We cannot do what we do not know. So certainly knowledge is important. Proximity to God's word is important. Exposing ourselves to the truth of God's word, to his Bible, is important. We must hear God's word before we can put it into practice. So James is saying something very simple from the onset. We've got to be able to hear God's word. But he lists two obstacles to hearing God's word. And these are key. In fact, he says this, take note of this. (laughs) Take some notes on this. My dear brothers, first of all, he says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. So what's the first obstacle to hearing God's word? Well, it's very simple, talking. (laughs) He says, be slow to speak. So he's talking about a rate at which to speak and a rate at which to be angry. There's nothing sinful in speaking. There's nothing inherently sinful in being angry provided that the anger is toward the right object, provided that that anger is rooted and motivated by godly anger. But there is a rate at which both talking, speaking, and anger can become sin. So here in this passage, he uses, when he says this slow to speak, in the Greek language, there is a Greek word. That Greek word is this, zip it. (laughs) You're doing this. You need to do this. Zip it. Sometimes we just need to be quiet and to be still and to be slow to speak but quick to hear. Solomon, the most wise person of the Old Testament, in his Proverbs, he talks about the correlation between wisdom and listening. If you read the first three chapters of Proverbs, you will see the word listen repeated time and time and time again. And particularly, he's talking about young people listening. (laughs) Listen is equated to wisdom. One of the Proverbs, he says, Better to be silent and be thought a fool than to speak and to remove all doubt. (laughs) There is wisdom in just listening. Secondly, he says, be slow to anger. Temper can be an obstacle to hearing. Temper, being quick to anger. Angry is one thing. Being quick to anger is a sign of something else going on inside of a person. It's a sign of bitterness. It's a sign of resentment. And James says it does not produce the righteousness of God. 
It doesn't lead to that kind of righteousness and good living. So let me ask you this question. How good are you at hearing God's word when you're angry? I'm not very good. Not very good at all. Bitterness, resentment, makes us deaf to God's word. So in order to hear, we must be slow to speak, we must be slow to anger. Secondly, he gives another imperative here. He says not only hear the word, he says receive the word. Look in verse 21. He talks about humbly, meekly, gently accepting or receiving the word of God. Now, what's the difference between hearing and receiving? There is a difference. Hearing is a physical action. Receiving is a mental attitude. Hearing is about listening. Receiving is about learning. Big difference between the two. So you're saying, Mike, I can hear but not learn? Yeah. (laughs) Mike, I can hear without receiving? Yeah. Ask your wife. (laughs) Wives, how many times has your husband heard but not received? So the sound waves are entering into the cavity of the ear and hitting against the drum. But it's not it's not clicking. It's not re- being received. That's James's point. He says, yeah, you've got to hear the word. Expose yourself to it. Uh, be, be in close proximity to it. Read it. Study it. But more than that, as you approach God's word, you should have an attitude of wanting to learn from it. There's a big difference between punching the clock on Sunday morning and coming into this room with a willingness and a heart to receive God's word. Big difference. And you can actually walk into this room, hydroplane through the service, and walk out having not received anything, even though you heard a lot. You see, God speaks through his word. It's never a problem of God not speaking. God always speaks through his word. The problem is, are we willing to receive what he is speaking to us about? So there are two obstacles James mentions to receiving. The first obstacle is this, persisting in sin. Persisting in sin. He says, get rid of all moral filth. Simply put, an immoral lifestyle, attaching ourselves to a lifestyle, to a pattern of sin, having a life of unconfessed sin, unrepentant heart, allows us the inability to actually receive God's word. It'll stand in the way. Persisting in sin, but then pride. Pride. In fact, the Bible intimates that pride is the enemy of God. It's the original sin. Knowing better than God. And pride can keep you from accepting and receiving God's word. Here he says to humbly accept humility. And he's talking about humility not with respect necessarily to God, although that's implied, and not humility with respect to our relationship with each other, although that's a good thing. He's talking about humility and reverence with respect to his word. And our attitude and how we approach God's word. Those who know it all, who've got it all figured out, are those who won't receive anything from God's word. So humility means that I submit myself to it. That it changes me, I don't change it. That what it says, although it may defy my logic, and although it may be against what is out in this world and what is in the culture, what it says is truth. And because by faith I accept that, I must humbly submit myself to God's word. And I'm telling you, there can be in Christians a spirit of pride with respect to God in his word. And it's subtle. It's not overt. Oftentimes it's just subtle where you walk in the room and I'm, I'm not listening, I'm not changing, and I'm, you know, I'm... 
and you're bucking up and you're, you know, this happened and that happened and you don't come in a submissive spirit to God's word. In fact, nobody can teach you anything. So pride can be an enemy. I remember a lady years ago just having this spiritual elitism. This idea of having it all figured out. Totally lacking any kind of humility with respect to her possibly learning something or being willing to receive anything from anybody else. She was the one providing all the answers, not taking any from anybody. And I remember her coming up to me after a service one time and saying, you know, I'm praying for you. I said, great, I'm glad you're praying for me. I need it. She said, I'm praying that you will begin to see things the way that I see them. And I said, well, how about praying for me that I will begin to see things the way that God sees them? That's what I'd really like. It wasn't a good conversation, but we we got through the Sunday morning. (laughs) Pride, pride, persisting in sin. Those are the things that can keep us from accepting God's word. So hear the word, receive the word, and then third, do the word. Do the word. It just doesn't get any more simple than that. Remember the old Nike ad? Just do it. That, by the way, was ranked the number one marketing slogan of all time. Just do it. And the little swoosh. It was very simple. Don't talk about it. Just do it. And that's what James is saying. Do the word. After you've heard it, after you've had a, a, a submissive spirit to it, to be willing to learn it and to receive it, then begin to put it into practice. And he talks about doing the word through three avenues. The first thing is the command in verse 22. The second thing is an illustration of doing the word in verses 23 through 25. And then he gives three applications as if he doesn't have enough practical advice here. He gives three ways to apply the doing of God's word in verses 26 through 27. So he says in verse 22, don't just merely listen to it. Do what it says. It's very simple. In other words, God wants disciples who are practicing the faith, who are actually doing what God's word says. And he says this, if you don't, you are lying to yourself. You are deceiving yourself. You are getting goosebumps. You are having spiritual warm fuzzies. But you walk out and you're not doing it. You are deceived and you are to be pitied. Because a faith like that is a faith that he will refer to later on in the book of James is a faith that is dead. So we're not really a disciple of Christ if we're not doing God's word. I'm not talking about perfect implementation. I'm not talking about that, okay? None of us are perfect. I'm talking about perfectionism or legalism. But I'm talking about a spirit that when we receive and what we receive, we will actually go and do. We will connect the dots between hearing and doing. That's what he's talking about. So if you're a disciple that is not practicing the faith, you're not really a disciple. Let's say, for instance, you need surgery. And you go to a doctor. And the doctor says, I know exactly what your problem is. In fact, I've studied it many times. I've read a lot of books about this. I've had a class in medical school on this ailment. And I know exactly what the problem is. You're going to have to have a surgery. You're saying, well, okay, great, I guess I need to have surgery then. He said, well, I can fix it. The problem is, is that in this surgery, I've never done a surgery before, but I'm looking for a great place to start. (laughs) And you're like, I don't think I'll be your guinea pig. Is a doctor really a doctor if he or she never practices medicine? I mean, anybody go to school and have the title is a piano really a piano if it never plays music is a plane really a plane if it never soars if it never flies looks like a plane is a disciple really a disciple if he or she never puts into practice God's word I don't think so so James is saying this listen Do it. 
connect those dots. I remember years ago, a seminary professor at the seminary that I attended who was a tr- kind of a traveling professor and he would teach students there on the campus and he would fly to, I think, San Antonio and to Austin and would fly sometimes to Florida to teach certain classes. Here was a man who was standing in front of students for hours every week and yet had developed a relationship with a flight attendant and over a period of months while teaching was having an affair with a flight attendant. A total disconnect. A total misunderstanding between hearing and doing. So James says, do the word. And he gives an illustration of doing the word. He gives an illustration. The illustration he gives is one of a mirror. And I have a mirror up here. You guys have noticed this. I'm going to you know, tuck it in a little bit there. Two things about a mirror. If, it, if, it's, if it's a pure mirror, it doesn't lie. <laughs> and it doesn't change. It doesn't change. And we have mirrors all over the place in our culture. I bet you ladies have probably got a mirror in your purse right now. You've got a mirror in your car. They're being used all the time. Let's say you were to look at yourself in the mirror and you were to have a big glob of mayonnaise on your lip. How likely would it be that you would walk away from that mirror without wiping it off? <laughs> or a big you know, black pepper in between your teeth? A few weeks ago, I had a, a, a little crusty flake right on the corner of my eye. And I came to church with it, and none of you said anything about it. (laughs) You ever have that happen? You you go, did you see this? (laughs) Yeah. Well, how long did you see it there? Well, it was there for a while. Why didn't you say anything? You know, that kind of thing. So anyway, we have these conversations. James is saying this. He says, the mirror is God's word and it reflects back truth to us. It doesn't lie. It doesn't change. It's permanent. And he says, the one who hears God, God's word but doesn't put it into practice is like the man who looks in the mirror with some kind of defect or something wrong and walks away without fixing it. See, he looks in the mirror and he sees that something's wrong but he goes away forgetting that something was wrong, is the words that he uses there in the passage. And what he calls that is deceit. See, we're lying to ourselves. We're, it's like looking in the mirror, seeing that something's wrong, and just lying to ourselves about it. So James is saying that God's word is the mirror that reflects back to you and me, and it reflects truthfully, and it reflects consistently. And we need to put it into practice. And then he gives three applications here at the end, and then we're done for today. Verses 26 through 27, three ways to know. Look in verse 26, three ways to know that we are practicing God's word. He says, if anyone considers himself religious, and by the way, that word there is a word that connotates participating in a religious ceremony of some kind. If anyone considers himself religious and does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself. And his religion, his exercise of religion, is worthless. And wow, he starts with the tongue. So again, as if he wasn't practical enough, here he talks about the tongue of all the places to start. The things that we say... The words that we use, James says, is evidence of the fact that we have applied or not applied God's word. So by belittling, by gossip, by a cynical spirit with words that create doubt in others, reveals what is true about us as far as the practice of God's word. And then in verse 27, he says, religion that, our, that God our Father accepts, so he is contrasting these two forms of religion. One that is deceptive, but the pure religion, the one that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless, is this, to look after orphans and widows. Wow. 
to look after orphans and widows. To look after those who are in need is the point. Your faith, your religion is worthless unless it translates into acts of mercy. You know, it's amazing. Orphans and widows have a unique place in the scripture. The Old Testament. There are commands after commands to take care of orphans and widows. And James is saying, when that takes place, listen, then that is pure and undefiled religion that God our Father accepts. It is evidence of the fact that you've got it and that you're doing God's word. We have a widow in our church who yesterday was put into the emergency room. And I was in a meeting with our church leadership team. We were in a meeting from 7.30 to 2 o'clock. It was all day. And when I got out of the meeting, I had this voicemail from somebody in our church about this widow. And she's doing okay. She was admitted in Tomball uh, Hospital. And um, by the time I was able to check my voicemail, uh, somebody had already contacted her. Somebody had already been there to visit her. In fact, I think the people who were there to visit her got there before she got there because her daughter called and there had already been a prayer request sent for her through email to all the people in her Bible fellowship group. By the time I got to the hospital, you know, it was all done. Caring for a widow. I'm so glad that we have the heart to put into practice what God's word says. And then he says in verse 27, also, to have a religion where it keeps oneself from being polluted by the world. Polluted, meaning unmixed. Being stained by the world, meaning that we think like the world, we have the same values as the world, we have the same priorities of the world. James is saying, listen, if that's true, then you're really not doing God's word. Is it the world or is it his word is the contrast. Those believers who are not set apart from the world are those believers who are not practicing the word of God. Hear the word, receive the word, do the word. It's real simple, isn't it? I mean, it'd be nice and convenient if it was more complex than that. And then we could wiggle out of it, maybe find a loophole here or there. Hear the word, receive the word, and do the word. Let me read this quote from A.W. Tozer one more time as we finish today. It appears that too many Christians want to enjoy the thrill of feeling right, but are not willing to endure the inconvenience of being right. How about you? How about you? What has God spoken to you about today? That one thing, what has he spoken to you about today? Will you do it? If you will, you will find that there is power in the Christian life. The power of our lives as believers is not found in knowing. It's found in doing what we know. Not doing God's word is a recipe for burnout. Not doing God's word is, is a recipe for frustration as a Christian. But having the faith to put it into practice is where true power lies. So I want to ask you this. I want to ask you to bow your heads. And I want to give you a moment to reflect and to respond to God's word. Maybe some of you this morning would say, you know, I need to do better just about hearing God's word. I come for an hour once a week, and that's just not enough, folks. And some don't even do that. And maybe you need to have a commitment in your heart and life to study God's word more and to be involved in groups where it's taught and to be committed to be here on the weekend. There's so many people that just for any reason, any inconvenience, check out on Sundays. 
You just need a commitment to hear God's word and to study it and to be exposed to it. Or maybe you've got a, an, an unwilling spirit. You're unwilling to learn, unwilling to be changed by it. Your heart is such that you're not willing to accept it and to receive it. You're here, but you're not here. Or maybe you're a Christian who knows a lot, hears a lot, studies a lot. And you just need the strength and the faith to put it into practice. God has been very specific with you about what to do and when to do it. And this morning, you just need to cross that line of faith where you're going to do it and trust God with it. So whatever it is, let me give you a moment to respond, to apply to what God has taught you. Father in heaven, thank you for the beauty of the wisdom of your word. Thank you for how you have provided it and preserved it for us. We can read the words of the brother of Jesus from 2,000 years ago, and it's alive in our hearts today. Father, the true power of your word is in our willingness to live it out. So give us the strength and the resources, Lord. Provide for us the faith that we need to put it into practice. And may we see when we do the reward of what it means to do your word, to love you by putting our faith into practice, and to allow you, Father, to change us because of it. We trust you for that, Father. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen.